This is a band I've had a lot of requests for and I'm glad I'm finally getting around to it. Kix was a hair metal band that achieved some success in the 80s and was signed to a major label in Atlantic Records, but they never achieved the level of success of their peers like Cinderella and Rat. Why? That's what we're going to talk about in today's video. Originally called Shoes and then The Generators, Kix formed in Maryland in 1977. The band consisted of guitarist Ronnie Yonkins, Brian Forsyth, bassist Donnie Purnell, and frontman Steve Whiteman, and drummer Jimmy Chalfont. Kix's influences included Grand Funk Railroad, Alice Cooper, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, Aerosmith, Kiss, and ACDC. In fact, these influences would show early on in the band's career, as Kix would cut their teeth on the bar circuit, playing a collection of covers including ACDC, Led Zeppelin, and The Stones, while also throwing in a few originals. The band would end up sending their demo tape to producer Kim Fowley, who took their demo to several labels. By early 1981, Kix would be invited to a showcase in New York City by Atlantic Records president Doug Morris. Bassist Donnie Purnell would tell the Washington Post, there were only six people in the rehearsal hall and performed just like there was a regular crowd out there. Pretty strange. After three songs, Morris walked out with our manager. We thought he was going to tell us to get lost, but he went out and said he thought we were ready. Released in 1981, the band's self-titled debut album featured 50s rock, metal, and blues influences. The album wouldn't chart, but back then labels were more than willing to nurture a band through several records. And to promote their debut album, the band would tour with Cheap Trick and Triumph, and headline their own Midwestern dates as well. The band's follow-up album, 1983's Cool Kids, would be the first album from the group to chart on the Billboard album charts, peaking at number 177. The record would be more pop and new wave influenced, and it would start the band's trend of working with outside songwriters. Two songs off the record, including the title track and Body Talk, would get the video treatment for MTV, but frontman Steve Whiteman would admit to VH1's That Metal Show that he personally hated the music videos for the record, and in a separate interview with SonicPerspectives.com, he revealed it was the band's least favorite album. Whiteman would lay the blame for the sound of the album at the feet of the label and the producer, who tried to tone down the group's sound to make them more radio friendly. As the band turned their attention to their third album, they wanted to regain more creative control with Whiteman telling Sleaze Rocks. We felt like on the next record, we needed to make the record that we wanted to make. We wanted melodies. Bands like Aerosmith, The Rolling Stones, and ACDC were huge influences for us. That was in the vein of what we wanted. That's how we wanted to be known for and recognized for. It was intentional to get away from that pop sound and get a lot harder, and that was more in line with the hair metal scene, you'd say. Kix's next record, 1985's Midnight Dynamite, would see the band employ outside songwriters including Kip Winger and Bob Halligan Jr., who previously worked with Kiss, Judas Priest, and Blue Oyster Cult. Despite getting the sound they wanted on the album, it failed to chart. Whiteman would mostly lay the blame at their record label, telling Sleaze Rocks, We felt that we had a hit record. We had one of the most powerful record companies in the world releasing our records. We had good management at the time, and we had Bo Hill coming on board, hot off the heels of a rat hit record. What could go wrong? We felt it was a hit, but Atlantic Records didn't know quite what to do with us. They released Cold Shower. It had very little success and little MTV airplay. When the song didn't take off, they were done with it. But the band wasn't ready to let the record die, and they soon self-funded their own tour across clubs in major cities, which actually paid fairly well. In a strange turn of events, Kicks, who were signed to a major label, soon found themselves opening for unsigned bands at the time, including Guns N' Roses. In fact, Steve Whiteman would tell the Washington Post in 1988 how frustrating the band's journey had been at this point in time, revealing everybody who's ever opened for us has gone on to be big stars. Guns N' Roses, Poison, Cinderella, White Lion, they've all opened for us and we've watched them all go big time. It's kind of frustrating, he'd say. And since there was a large gap between the group's third and fourth record, the band's label got the song No Ring Around Rosie to be included in the 1987 film Johnny Be Good. After almost 10 years, Kix finally hit it big with their fourth album, Blow My Fuse, which was released in September of 1988. The band took an unusual approach to choosing tracks for the album. They had written 40 or so songs for the record, and according to Whiteman, Kix decided to test market them, gathering some friends, younger brothers and sisters around Hagerstown, as well as a similar teen group in Long Island. The album initially sold about the same number of copies as their previous record, but it wasn't until Atlantic Records released the power ballad Don't Close Your Eyes 
that the album really took off. The song would peak at number 11 on the Hot 100 charts, and the single Cold Blood would also get the video treatment and become a top 10 hit on MTV's Headbangers Ball. The album would become Kix's biggest of their career going platinum, and the record also presented the band with some big time touring opportunities, opening for both Rat and Cinderella. I recently did a whole video on Robin Crosby of Rat, which is one of the most popular videos on my channel. Check out the link below to watch it. Getting back to the story, it also seemed like Whiteman and the band's attitude towards their label had changed as the frontman would tell the Washington Post in 1988. With this record, the kind of music that we make is really popular right now. We've changed management and Atlantic finally realized that you can break a band, making it a success, without getting them on the radio. With tour and video support, they hired a new heavy metal department and they worked real hard, so the whole attitude of the record company has changed towards music like ours. And this is from the label that brought us Led Zeppelin and Bad Company. It just feels like justice being due, he'd say. And as the 80s came to a close, the band turned their attention to their next record, 1991's Hotwire, which sold about two-tenths of their previous record, moving about 200,000 copies. Released in June of 1991, the album came out a few months before alternative and grunge music took over. While the record did have a modest hit single with Girl Money, it wasn't enough. And it wasn't too long after the album was released that Atlantic cut its losses and dropped the band. They would sign a new deal though with CMC Records who put out their next album, 1995 Show Business. And between their album releases, the music industry had undergone a massive shift and their brand of music had died in 1991. The band would break up in 1996 and its members would focus on other musical projects. Whiteman perfectly summarized the band's breakup and decline in popularity, telling the Front Row Report, Basically, there was a new party in town, and we weren't invited anymore. We went from playing arenas down to playing clubs down to playing, we called them French fry stands. I mean, it was so bad that we could hardly make a living at it anymore. So we knew it was time to call it a day. I still needed to rock, so I started Funny Money a year later. It wasn't until 2003 that the band reunited minus bassist Donnie Purnell, who had a falling out with Whiteman, over the recording of a song, as he would state in this interview. We had a conversation on the phone. I was going to uh, record a song with Funny Money that him and I had co-written. And I just called him up to say, hey, I'm going to record this song just to let you know. He tore me an ass. Oh, I mean, man. he jumped down my throat. And I just let him go. I held the phone out for about 20 minutes and let him rant and rave. And, and after he was done ranting, I said, I'm really sorry you feel like that. I used to have a lot of respect for you. We're done. Recording new material seemed tricky for the band as Purnell wrote most of the music, but in 2014 they would put out their first album in nearly two decades, releasing Rock Your Face Off. To this day, the band is still around touring. So that does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again on Rock and Roll True Stories. Take care.